Welcome to another tutorial video. This time we're going to be addressing how you might complete a debt versus equity analysis to advise a company on its best financing option. So here's the question that came in the other day. I have an upcoming investment banking case study where I'll have 60 minutes to analyze a company's financial statements and recommend debt or equity. How should I do this? What analysis or qualitative considerations should I include? As always, I'm going to give you a short answer for this that explains how to do this quickly and efficiently. And then we'll go into a slightly longer answer and look at a real life example of a company that had to choose between raising debt or equity for its financing needs. The short answer to this question is that all else being equal, companies want the cheapest possible financing for expansion projects and M&A deals and anything else for which they might need extra capital. In most cases, this means debt because it is generally cheaper than equity because interest paid on debt is tax deductible, and also lenders' expected returns are lower than those of equity investors, and so the after-tax cost of debt is almost always less than the after-tax cost of equity. Now, of course, this is not always true if a company is trading at a very high price-to-earnings multiple, for example, it might be the opposite, but for most companies out there, debt is going to be cheaper than equity. Of course, the problem with debt is that there are also constraints and limitations on it. A lender is not going to just let a company borrow unlimited amounts of debt. Instead, there will be constraints in the form of a leverage ratio, so a certain debt to EBITDA level that a company cannot exceed, or the coverage ratio. In other words, the company has to keep its EBITDA divided by interest above a certain level. There could be a debt service coverage ratio, and there could be many others. So lenders heavily constrain the amount and types of debt that a company can raise. To give a company a recommendation on debt versus equity, you have to test these constraints first and then proceed accordingly. Step one in this process is to create different scenarios for the company. These could be very simple, such as lower revenue growth and lower margins in the downside case, revenue growth and margins closer to market expectations in the base case, and growth and margins above market expectations in the upside case. And then if you want to go even more pessimistic, you could have an extreme downside case that has the company's business declining and falling off a cliff because of market conditions, mismanagement at the company, and so on. Then you want to stress test the company in these different cases and see if it can meet its required credit stats, ratios, and other requirements in the downside cases. If it can, then you're set and you can go with the form and type of debt financing that the company wants to use. If not, then you're going to have to try alternative debt structures and see if they work instead. For example, if the company wants to use term loans to take advantage of lower interest rates, maybe it runs into trouble with certain credit stats and ratios when using them. So instead of using term loans, you propose a different package where there are no principal repayments, but where interest rates are higher. And you might see if that works instead and if the company can meet its credit stats and ratios under that structure. And if none of that works, then you have to resort to equity, which is almost always gonna be more expensive than debt for some or all of the company's financing needs. Now, you don't necessarily want to say that this company cannot afford debt, therefore it should use 100% equity. It might be a combination of debt and equity that works best, but you will probably have to use some equity if you cannot get the credit stats and ratios to work in the downside cases, regardless of the type of debt that you're using. That was the short answer. Now let's go into a slightly longer answer and look at this Central Japan Railway case study. This is one of our case studies in the interview guide and modeling courses, and it's based on the Central Japan Railway Company. Essentially, they want to expand and offer a new line between Tokyo and Nagoya in Japan, and also between Tokyo and Osaka. They need a lot of money to do it, and they're considering three main options, which I've laid out in the case study document. Equity funding, term loans, and subordinated notes. So the additional equity funding is nice in theory because it would incur no additional interest expense, there would be no debt principal repayments, but it would also represent 43% of the company's current market cap. Just based on that alone, we can tell that the solution is probably not gonna be 100% equity because 43% of the company's market cap is a huge amount of new shares to issue. Now the second option would be term loans with 10-year maturities, 5% amortization per year, 4% interest rates roughly, and a 50% cash flow sweep. In other words, the company has to use 50% of its available cash flow to repay the term loans if it can. And there are standard maintenance covenants. In this case, we have 
leverage ratio covenants. So the company cannot go above 4x to 3x debt to EBITDA. We also have one for the net debt to EBITDA ratio. We have a 4x minimum coverage ratio. So EBITDA divided by interest expense can never go below 4x. And then we have a debt service coverage ratio, which is sort of a combination of those. We look at the company's cash flow available for debt service. We add back the interest expense. And then we divide that by the company's mandatory principal repayments plus the interest expense to see how much cash flow a company has relative to the amount of required debt payments and debt service it has to make during the course of a year. And then the third option, the subordinated notes also have 10 year maturities. There is no amortization, but interest is higher. So we have a very clear trade off there. No amortization and higher interest versus some amortization and lower interest. There are no early repayments, so the company doesn't have to use any cash flow to repay debt. And the only covenant is a debt service coverage ratio one. So we don't have any restrictions on the total debt to EBITDA or EBITDA divided by interest or anything like that. As is usually the case, the debt is cheaper here. So we start off with the term loans, option number two, since they have only 4% interest. And right now, I have the scenario in this model set up to be just like that. So we have roughly 4% interest on the term loans, 5% amortization, and we've created a couple different scenarios for this company. The main difference being that in the base case, we have modest growth. In the downside case and extreme downside cases, we have flat growth to negative growth, and our margins are also higher in the base case and lower in the downside and extreme downside cases, and our capital expenditure requirements are lower in the base case and higher in the downside and extreme downside cases. With the term loans, most of the other covenants and ratios are fine. We never go above our maximum debt to EBITDA or maximum net debt to EBITDA. The interest coverage ratio is fine, but we run into trouble with the debt service coverage ratio. And we go below the minimum in years three and four. The main reason for this is because the company has to repay a lot of that debt principal each year. If we change this to the downside case, which is what lenders tend to focus on, the numbers for the debt service coverage ratio get even worse and we don't comply with it any year and it gets even worse if we go to the extreme downside case so what this tells us is that it would be almost impossible for this company to comply with this minimum debt service coverage ratio covenant that lenders have specified even in the base case and it looks a lot worse than the downside cases so the next logical alternative is to try a different form of debt the subordinated notes have an advantage in that they don't have principal repayment they do have a higher interest rate so let's go back up and change some of this around. I'm gonna change this back to the base case. And then for the interest, I will make this effectively 8% and I will remove the amortization right here. I will also remove the cash flow sweep so it matches the terms that have been specified. In this case, it looks a lot better. We stay above that minimum debt service coverage ratio in all years in the base case. And then in the downside case, it's still better, although we do dip below it in years three through five here. And then in the extreme downside case, we go below it in years two, three, four, and five. So the overall conclusion is that the numbers look a bit better, but there were still some issues in the downside and extreme downside cases. One solution would be to offer a completely different form of debt that uses sculpting which is common in project finance and infrastructure and lets us vary the interest and principal repayments over time. So as the project comes closer to completion and as the company starts generating extra revenue and cash flow from it, we have a higher debt service requirement. But that is not an option here. We only have three options. So we're gonna have to use more equity in this case because the company still can't comply with these ratios. We get to try 25% or 50% to start. And we could simulate this by setting the EBITDA multiple for the debt in the beginning to 1x or 1.5x instead. And if you think about the numbers here, if we have 2x debt to EBITDA initially, and we set this to 1.5x, that means that 25% or 0.5x is going to come in the form of equity. If we set it to 1x, it means that 1x EBITDA or 50% is going to come in the form of equity. So I'll try 1.5x first. I will set this to the downside case and see what happens. And in this case, we do a lot better. We don't comply completely. We still have a problem in year four, but all the rest of the years are in compliance. Now, if we set this to the extreme downside case, 
we run into some issues in years three, four, and five. So another option here would be to try 50% debt, 50% equity instead. I've just changed the EBITDA multiple to 1x there to simulate that. And we're in the downside case once again. Going down, we pretty much comply with the covenants in all the cases, all the years except for year four. If we change it to the extreme downside case, then we comply in years one through three. Year four, we don't quite get there. And then year five, we almost get there. So year four is problematic, although we could find other ways to deal with that. Our inclination based on this analysis is that we think either a 50-50 mix between subordinated notes and equity is better if we believe there's a real risk of the extreme downside case happening, or if we think the normal downside case is more plausible, a 75% subordinated note, 25% equity mix might be better for this company. You might be wondering about the qualitative factors, and usually it's best to use these to back up your argument and recommendations based on the numbers. So for example, we could point to the company's extremely high EBITDA margins, low revenue growth, and stable cash flows because it really has a near monopoly on the transportation market in the central part of Japan, which means that in many ways it has the ideal profile of a company that wants to raise debt. If you look, just to give you an idea of what I mean, even in the extreme downside case, the company has 35 to 40% EBITDA margins or operating margins here, which is extremely high for any company, especially one in an industry like transportation and railroads. We don't directly speak to the company's stable revenue and cash flow here, but if you look at the growth rates, you can see that there isn't really a risk of everything disappearing overnight, so that's not a true concern here. Also, there's very limited downside risk. Population decline is probably the main issue. The population in Japan will decline over the coming decades pretty substantially, but that's more of a concern for 30 or 40 years into the future. Over the next five to 10 years, the population will go down a little bit, but the effect will be more pronounced in rural areas as opposed to Tokyo and Osaka and other urbanized areas. So we think it's a limited risk here. Let's do a recap and summary of this analysis. Companies generally want the cheapest funding possible for expansion projects, acquisitions, and other initiatives. And usually that means debt because interest paid on debt is tax deductible, interest rates are lower, and the after-tax cost of debt is lower than the after-tax cost of equity because returns expectations are lower. But debt also has constraints, and so you have to see if the company can comply with those constraints, especially in the downside and more pessimistic cases. If it can, then you can use the proposed debt package. If it can't, then you have to try other structures and all other alternatives for debt. And if none of those work, then you may have to start adding in equity. It's more expensive, but at least the company can comply with its covenants and credit stats and ratios when you start mixing equity and debt for the company's financing needs. And then you can use the qualitative factors at the end to support your recommendation. So that is a short and then a slightly more detailed and longer answer for how you can make debt and equity recommendations for companies and advise them on their best financing options.